Um, my name is Zhong Yi Chen. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, today I'm going to present our work on um, IoT vulnerability detection. Uh, this is a joint collaboration with Jinan University, University of Texas at Dallas, The Ohio State University, and Indiana University Bloomington. As you all know that nowadays, IoT is getting more and more popular. Um, according to a study, the connected things will reach, to, uh, reach more than 20 billion by 2020. And even the global smart home market will rise to more than 50 billion by 2022. Um, IoT has gone into every corner of our daily life, but the security of IoT is lagged behind. Um, a recent study shows that more than 90 dependent IoT attacks have been reported from 2014 to 2016. Um, for example, the Marine botnet exploits the default credential of IoT devices. And um, more recently, the Reaper um, exploits the uh, device vulnerabilities to launch the DOS attack against um, online services. These incidents reveal that many of these IoT devices are poorly implemented and loosely protected. But how do we systematically discover these vulnerabilities before attackers do? Um, it turns out that existing approaches require us to first acquire the firmware. Uh, but the problem is that vendors may not make their firmware images publicly available. Uh, once we obtain the firmware, um, the next step is to identify and unpack the firmware, but architectures may be unknown and uh, vendors may use proprietary compression or, encry or encryption algorithms to pack the firmware. Um, if we can suc successfully handle the firmware acquisition and firmware unpacking, we then analyze executables. Um, static analysis suffers from disassembling errors and inaccurate points to analysis. Uh, for dynamic analysis, um, vendors may disable the debugging ports. Um, then we are unable to uh, debug instrument or fast the program. Um, if we emulate the program, extract, uh, if we emulate the extracted program from the um, firmware, um, it has emulation problems due to diverse architectures and the lack of and we run parameters in the firmware. So in this work, we provide an alternative approach to identify vulnerabilities in those devices. We found that IoT official apps play an important role in controlling and managing IoT devices. They contain rich information about IoT devices. For example, they are the major data input channel of IoT device. Um, they contain command messages. Um, also, they preserve protocol specifications and the encryption schemes of those messages. Therefore, we built a tool based on uh, IoT app to fast the IoT devices. We call it IoT Fuzzer. It is a firmware-free fuzzing framework that uh, detects memory corruptions in those devices uh, by utilizing program-specific logics in um, those apps to produce meaningful test cases. Um, a highlight feature is that it fuzzes in a protocol-guided way without explicitly reverse engineering the protocol. Let's see how we do this. Um, when, we, when we started to build such a tool, we encountered several challenges. First of all, the vendors may use uh, they do not use unified protocol formats. For example, they may use XML, JSON, or just key-value pairs. Uh, as you can be seen on the left-hand side, is a piece of example code we extracted from an IoT app. The protocol, uh, the message format is JSON. Um, um, we wish to um, handle the diverse protocol formats. Um, but re automatically reverse engineering the protocol is too heavy. Uh, secondly, we found that some of these vendors use 
their own crypto functions to encrypt the message. Uh, in this example, the, um, that is the message encryption function. Um, it doesn't even use crypto APIs. Um, uh, to fast the device, we need to extract and or um, re-implement the crypto functions out of the box, which is difficult. Another challenge is that once the message has been sent out, uh, we don't know if a crash has been uh, triggered. Okay. Uh, luckily, we have the following insights to um, tackle the problems. Our solution to the first challenge is to directly mutate protocol fields before they are constructed as a whole message. Um, naturally, we can achieve protocol guided fuzzing. And uh, secondly, we replay crypto functions in context. Um, therefore, we, can, uh, we don't, do not need to extract or re-implement the crypto functions. Um, for the third challenge, uh, we insert heartbeat messages to detect whether the device is still alive. Um, a heartbeat message is just a valid message that inquires about the status of the IoT device. Um, IoT apps will periodically send such message to, um, to acquire the latest status of the device. Okay. Um, here is the system architecture. Um, there, at a high level, there are two phases. Phase one is app analysis. Specifically, we perform UI analysis to um, obtain the networking UI elements, and then we perform tent tracking to identify the protocol fields to mutate. Our phase two is fuzzing. We use dynamic API hooking to mutate the protocol fields and also monitor the responses. For UI analysis, um, we first construct code paths from networking APIs to UI uh, event handlers uh, to identify the uh, UI, uh, networking UI elements, and uh, we also interact with UI elements and record those activity transitions. Uh, then in further steps, we can uh, trigger those events and um, to generate uh, messages uh, for ten tracking and fuzzing. Um, the goal of ten tracking is to identify the protocol fields, and we also identify the functions that the fields pass to. The reason that we also identify the functions that the fields pass to is um, we use API hooking to mutate protocol fields. Um, those fields are passed to uh, these functions as function arguments. We define ten sources to be strings, some CSEN APIs that potentially return um, um, a protocol fields in the message, uh, such as get MAC address or um, a get altitude. And uh, we define um, 10 sources to be users inputs like get text. 10, so 10 things are those data uses at networking APIs and encryption functions. Here is an example of 10 tracking output. On the left hand side, um, those strings are first used at these functions. And um, therefore, the 10 tracking outputs are those functions with the marked parameters. Um, once we obtain the functions to hook, um, we mutate those. Um, function arguments, and um, then we schedule our fuzzing by first controlling the maximum number of total mutation times. Then we assign, randomly assigning mutation times to these locations. Um, then we mutate the values using the following heuristics, like changing the length of strings, changing the integer double or float values and changing the types or just providing empty values. The next step is to monitor responses. Uh, intuitively, the responses can be categorized into the following types, expected response um, and unexpected response 
and no response, meaning that a crash has been triggered or the device just digests the um, message locally without responding back. Um, and this connection for TCP-based connection. Uh, we found that it's hard to identify whether a crash has been triggered based on these response types. Um, therefore, we um, detect crashes based on the following two rules. The first rule is um, for TCP-based connection, if there is a disconnection, then we think that a crash has been triggered. Um, for UDP-based connection, it, we insert heartbeat, a heartbeat message within every several seconds uh, during fuzzing to confirm the status of the device. To evaluate the tool, we selected 17 products of different categories, categories offered by mainstream manufacturers like uh, IP camera, smart bubble, um, smart plug, and et cetera. As you can see, the protocols are diverse and some of them are encrypted. Uh, 15 memory corruptions were discovered, include, including eight of them were previously unknown. We reported these bugs to the corresponding vendors. They confirmed and updated, uh, most of them confirmed that and updated uh, uh, their uh, firmware. For these unknown crashes, um, we couldn't confirm the status of uh, the uh, vulnerability types of um, this crash um, because we couldn't get the firmware. We test, uh, tested each device for 24 hours. Here we show the number of crashes reported by Alti Fraud and the num um, those in yellow and purple. Um, and we show the number of uh, actual crashes, those in purple. Uh, as you can see, Altifrazer doesn't, uh, didn't uh, find any bugs in some of these devices, and um, those in yellow are false positives. Um, uh, they are caused by network errors and some unknown behavior of the program because uh, many of these devices are poorly implemented um, and the communication is not very reliable. We also compared um, it with other two popular fathers, Saleh and Bat. Um, Saleh is a popular network, open source network um, father, uh, and Bat is a network father in Kali Linux. Um, as you can see, um, Altifarzer can handle encrypted messages. And generally, it takes less time to find a bug, but it takes more time to produce a test case. Um, for some bugs that consume H standard HTTP header, Altifarzer is less efficient compared to with these two fathers. There are also some limitations. Um, first, it requires physical IoT devices, which can be expensive. And it only supports local Wi-Fi connection. And we are going to extend this to Bluetooth and Zigbee connection modes. Um, another limitation is that the code coverage is limited. It can only fuzz app-related code in IoT devices. And for crash detection, it only detects memory corruptions that actually cause program to crash. In summary, we built a firmware fuzzing framework for IoT devices based on mobile apps. And we also developed new techniques like protocol guided fuzzing without protocol specifications and in context cryptographic and network function replay. By conducting experiments, we identified 15 memory corruptions in 17 IoT devices uh, with IoT father. Do you have any questions? Okay, so this is Xi Wenfu from UCF. I have a question about uh, your work, and it's very really nice, right? You, you found a lot of uh, problems with those IoT devices. So to attack those IoT devices, for example, you find uh, the buffer overflow and the uh, heap stack, heap based buffer overflow, uh, uh, overflows. So the problem is, if you want to attack, what if uh, 
the communication is encrypted. If there's authentication, everything is encrypted. So if you want to attack as an outsider, I mean, can you still perform the attack? I mean, so let's assume all the communication is encrypted, right? And uh, yeah. so, as, so you, don't ha you don't have the pa password, uh, you don't have the username, can you still actually perform the remote attack? Oh, thank you. That's a very good question. I think it depends on the adversary model. The scope of this work is to, um, it's like testing the, whether the device is uh, buggy or vulnerable. So um, it depends how, uh, if you want to attack the device. Hi, my name is Mohsen from Arizona State. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, my question is about uh, which kind of instrumentation tool did you use for, during your research, FRIDA or uh, for just getting the messages and changing them uh, you know, in the memory? Yeah. Which kind of instrumentation tool did you use? Oh, uh, exposed. Exposed? Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, do you have the, your implementation uh, in the GitHub? Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, did you publish your implementation in the GitHub? Oh, no, not yet. Okay. And um, how did you, f okay. Oh, thank you. Hi, so Terry Dimitri, University of Illinois. I uh, had a question regarding the code analysis part. So how does your tool know whether a network connection is a local uh, connection or a remote connection? And how do you know that that connection is destined for an IoT device or just goes? Yeah, we can test the, if it's remote connection, we then we can handle that. Um, actually, those devices we purchased, uh, they, are, they, are sub they support both remote connection and local connection, connection, and we disabled the remote connection. Yeah, we isolated that in a, um, in a um, local Wi-Fi uh, environment. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.